for adoption by my birth parents. At least I think I was. And now I'm supposed to stand here in front of you all in hopes to inspire you? You think you're having a tough day? Try being me right now. <laughs> my name is Tia Bhatia. Okay, it is. My real name is Kogar Bhatia. I was adopted in the early 1990s from an orphanage in New Delhi. Now, I don't know why I was put up for adoption. Keep in mind that just because I was adopted, that doesn't change the fact that I am not my parents' daughter. So I don't know why I was put up. I don't even know who my birth parents are. Was it because I was a girl? Or was it because they couldn't afford me? How do I know they were trying to protect me from something? Maybe I have a brother. And they wanted another son, and I couldn't be that son. There are so many questions that I don't have the answers to. But what I do know is this. My parents got married in India in 1984 and moved to Toronto. At that time, they decided to take the route of adoption. My dad always wanted to adopt a baby girl, and my mom loved the concept of giving a child a life that they might not have been able to receive. So they started the process. Now in the 80s, you had to legally be married for two years before you could adopt, and of course, have a sufficient amount of income to take care of a new child. So my dad started getting busy with his business. My mom was waiting for his paperwork as they were being processed. Years passed. Eventually, after six years, my parents got that call. They got a call that you are approved for adoption and that there are 19 girls available for adoption at an orphanage in New Delhi, India. Now, I'm not from New Delhi. I was actually born in Ambala. I don't know much of what happened during that time. But what I do know is that I was extremely underweight. I was malnourished. My tongue was purple because of deficiency and I had no hips. Now from an orphanage in Avala, there were two girls that were chosen that were shifted to a bigger orphanage in Lillian. I was one of them. And when my parents received that call in the middle of the night, my dad made sure that my mom was on a flight the next morning on her way to India. While in transit, my mom's two sisters came to the orphanage to look at these 19 beautiful girls. And they saw me. And for some reason, they fell in love with me. I asked my mom's two sisters, what is it about me that attracted you? And they always tell me that there was something in your eyes, something that told us to make me your family. So they decided that if their sister, when she arrives, chooses to adopt another child, one of them would adopt me. Do you guys believe in destiny? Yeah. yeah. Because let me tell you, at this point, I have to believe I was destined to be a part of this family. So when my mom came to India, she came to the orphanage. She knew whoever this first child was going to be would be her child, and the first child was me. And from that point on, she had someone to call her Ma. And I was brought into such a huge and loving family. This family didn't care about the fact that I wasn't blood. All they cared about was love. This family only cared about the fact that there's this child and we are going to give her a better life. Now my mom decided to get me checked. Remember that hole in the heart I was talking about? Yeah. Guess what the physician found? So my mom called the orphanage and she told them, my child has a hole in her heart. You didn't tell me. And you know what they said? They said, you can exchange the child. And if I have some defective toy with a return policy, you can get a new one. My mom was shocked. So she called my dad and told him everything that was going on. And he said, keep in mind, he didn't even meet me yet. And he said, this daughter is mine. I'm not giving her back. She is mine. Now, this wasn't the only complication my parents came across. Remember when I said, I don't know why I was given up for adoption? So my parents wanted to make sure that I wasn't given up for any wrong reasons. 
that I didn't just get lost and end up at the orphanage. So they took my picture, took my information, and put it in the newspaper, missing child, and waited for someone to come and claim me. But at that time, a huge complication arose. My adoption papers were being processed, but lawyers went on strike. My adoption was pushed back even more. So my mom's brother-in-law was going from Delhi to Mbala, Mbala to Delhi, Delhi to Mbala, Mbala to Delhi, nonstop, trying to get all the paperwork done without these lawyers. And then the lawyer strike ended. And no one came to claim me three months later. But I was still sitting there in India with a hole in my heart, not able to come to Canada legally because of my health. So my dad flew to India. And this is the first time we met. And from that point on, we were inseparable. I'm pretty sure, if you guys follow me on social media, you know how inseparable we truly are. And so my dad decided that I have to take her to the Canadian Embassy in Delhi and see what can be done to maybe speed up her paperwork. And for some reason that day, I was so hyper. I was being the bratty child I was supposed to be. And this doctor came out. He was a Canadian doctor. He came out to check me. And he looks at me. And the moment that he started touching me, I started laughing. I started giggling. He looks at my dad right away and says, she's mine. Stop being that done. I end up in Canada. And I was put into Sick Kids Hospital where I had a massive open heart surgery. If it wasn't for sick kids, I wouldn't be here today. If it wasn't for my parents, I wouldn't be standing here today. So when I came to Canada, my dad was met with very few individuals who asked him, why did you adopt a boy and not a girl? Wouldn't the girl be a burden? She's going to get married. She's going to move in with her husband and his family. And my dad said, stop, don't tell me how my daughter is going to live her life. No child is a burden, no girl is a burden. My dad knew what happens to these girls in villages and how they're treated. And he wanted to show, yes, a male can carry a legacy, but a female can carry that legacy as well. They told me that I was adopted, and they had this way of telling me that I felt so special. So like a naive little child I was, I went to school, and I told all these kids, hey guys, I'm adopted and I'm special. <laughs> <laughs> but little did I know that it would backfire on me. All of a sudden, these kids began to tell me that I'm unloved while my parents are telling me that I'm loved. These kids are telling me that I'm unwanted while these parents are telling me that I'm wanted. These kids are telling me that these parents gave me up because they didn't like me. They told me I would give it up because I was ugly, because I was dirty. I was crying myself to sleep. I'd wake up every day not wanting to go to school. I made all these excuses. The bullying kept increasing, kept increasing, 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 increasing. Until one day I broke. And something inside of me told me, go talk to your parents. And I went and told them, Mom and Dad, I'm hurt. I'm going through a lot at school. I'm being bullied because I'm adopted. And they looked at me and said, do you understand what we went through to get you? Do you know the complication we faced to have you? Do you know you were accepted by everybody with open arms? Did you know that you were a choice? And I went, wow. At that moment, it didn't matter to me what these kids were saying. What mattered to me was that I was loved. I was the chosen one. At that point, my parents weren't just mom and dad anymore. 
They were my best friends. And I realized how important it is to have that relationship of best friends with your parents. Like many young kids, when I was 16, I went through a dark period in my life. I dealt with depression. I started closing myself off from the world, my family, my friends. I started locking myself in my room, crying, having all these negative thoughts. And I didn't know how to go and tell my parents that, Mom, Dad, your daughter is sad and she is depressed. Because depression meant that you were mentally unstable, right? See, in India, within the South Asian culture, there is a stigma with depression. And so I thought if I told them that something is wrong with me, that I would be judged. I remember having a conversation with my mom. She told me that there's no such thing as depression in India. And I said, what are you talking about? People have it. She said, I only found out when I came here what depression was. And it's because nobody talks about it there. Nowadays, things have changed and you have these big celebrities who talk about it. But before, no one really did. And so my mom saw that I was closing myself off. And like best friends, my parents stepped into my life. Like best friends, they were there for me. Like best friends, I had a shoulder to lean on. I survived because of my parents. I survived because of my positive surroundings. I survived because of my friends. And I survived because of one more thing, acting. Now, ever since I was a kid, and my parents asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be an actor. But then I said I wanted to be a teacher, I wanted to be a lawyer, I wanted to be so-and-so. But it would always come back to acting. And then they told me, pick up something more reasonable, because they knew how tough this industry is. And so I said, okay. I'm going to be a cardiovascular surgeon. <laughs> okay, that didn't happen. That wasn't bad. I'm going to be a teacher. But then it always came back to acting. And as I was dealing through my tough times, something inside of me told me that you need to pursue this career. So I talked to my parents. Imagine this, going to your family, especially if you have an Indian family, and saying, hi, mom and dad. I know you've worked so hard. You immigrated to Canada to give you a better life, and you have created this wonderful business and wonderful empire for your only daughter, but I don't want anything to do with that. I want to go into acting. <laughs> I remember their faces that day. It took a while to convince them, but because I had that relationship of friends, they agreed. Now this acting world is so beautiful. I find it so mesmerizing. I love the fact that I can be anyone that I want to be. That I can feel the way another person feels and I can understand things that they're thinking. And acting helped me through my depression and it still is helping me. I used to pick up scripts to make myself feel better. I would turn on the TV and watch acting scenes and study them. I would take my scenes from my class and start opening it and reading it and study even more. And it made me feel better because acting, for me, is therapeutic. It's not therapy. I remember when I got my first film. And I remember this so clearly. On the right side were some of the castmates. And on the left side were my parents. And now on the big screen came my scene. I hear somebody sniffling. And me and the castmates look to the left, and my mom's crying, buckets, like buckets. And from that moment and on, my parents knew that we have to support her in this career, that this is what she is going to choose. Now, of course, many people think that you audition, and then you get a film role, a TV role, and you earn a lot of money, and you take off, and you succeed. But that's not true at all. Imagine going into an audition room where everyone looks like you. I kid you not. They call for the same ethnicity. And I've walked in many times and I thought, oh, this girl might be better for the role because she looks more of a part. Imagine that a thousand people are auditioning for the same role that you are auditioning for and only one person is gonna get it. And if they get it, they might have a job for a day, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, maybe some months, if you're lucky. And then they have to start from scratch again. Yes, of course, sometimes they succeed, but there's a whole different struggle when they're up there as well. But one thing acting taught me was how to face rejection. Now when I have obstacles thrown at me, I can take the hit, I can fight, and I can move forward. I realize that there's many things that are not in my control, but what is in my control is how I react to these situations. 
What's in my control is furthering my career. Now this industry has many highs and lows, and I've decided to take each low as a life lesson within my personal life and my career. And this leads me to YouTube. So I have many friends that are on this platform, some which are here today. And I realized and saw firsthand what it did for their careers. And I thought to myself, okay, this is easy. I'm just gonna go record a video and post it online. Simple as that. I posted my video and then I panicked and I took it down. Because I realized that acting prepared me for rejection, but it didn't prepare me for negative comments. It didn't prepare me for the judgment of this whole world. And I learned that I have to love myself even more before I come onto this platform. I have to be confident with myself. So two, two years ago, I put up my first video. And then I continuously put up videos. And I was able to respond to these negative comments. I was able to be okay with the people not agreeing with my views because I felt more comfortable with myself. And now I can proudly say that two years later, I'm standing on YouTube with over 31 million views. So YouTube and social media became such an outlet for me. I realized that I could share my opinions and thoughts with all of you. I started responding to negative comments and when sometimes I'd be met with an apology. Well, sometimes I was met with ignorance, but I knew I had to say what I had to say. I had no regrets. And I started focusing my energy on what mattered the most. Kids from all different backgrounds, people from all different backgrounds who needed an escape, who can come to my channel and feel like that they are not alone, who can relate to me and feel that we are one big family. And that's why I started YouTube. With everything that's going on and everything that I learned, I realized that if I can give back to somebody who's facing a similar situation like I did, then that means more to me than any materialistic gift anyone can ever give me. No matter how busy I get in my personal life, no matter how busy I am with my career, I know I will always take that moment to help another who reaches out to me as much as I can. Now I don't know where I'm gonna be in the next 10 to 15 years, but what I do know is that I'm gonna help these kids find loving homes. I'm gonna help parents complete their families, I'm going to bring more awareness to adoption because I know what it can do for the kids and the parents. With everything that I just said, as I look back, I realize that I probably shouldn't even be here speaking to all of you today with this opportunity because there were so many obstacles in my way to get here. But because I can, I'm going to make sure that my voice is heard. I want each one of you to know that you matter. Your voice matters, your story matters, because what you have been through or are going through, someone else is going through. So take a moment from thinking about yourself and think about somebody else. Earlier, I spoke to you all about destiny. If destiny is a path that is predetermined by a higher being, then for me, those higher beings are my parents, because they're the ones who change my path. And they're the ones, because of them, standing here right now. I'm going to leave you with one last story. So last year, I went to India with my dad and this wonderful organization called World, World Vision. And we made enough money to be able to build washrooms for girls in schools and villages. Such a simple initiative, just think about it. Washrooms for girls. Like, you don't know how much of an impact it really has until you go there. When I went there, I physically saw that I was greeted with tears and happiness. By what? By giving a basic need? There was this one girl who was voted as a class speaker. And she spoke on the school's behalf. And she told me there's many reasons why these girls can't come to school without washrooms. She told me that a lot of these young girls, in order to go to the washroom, they would go a little further away from their homes and schools into the bushes, where sadly chances of them being raped were increased. And whenever they went through their menstrual cycle, for one whole week they would miss on their education because they had nowhere to clean themselves. So my dad 
this wonderful team and I went to India to build these washrooms to make sure these girls can be educated. It's crazy, right? Some of these children don't have basic needs. I mean, when did basic needs become such a luxury? We could just go to a store nearby and buy anything we need for our oral hygiene. And they can't. They're trying to find all these places where they can clean themselves. Think about it. So this little girl, keep in mind she's 13 years old. She told me how happy she is that now her and her friends can be educated. I asked her, what do you want to be? She said, I want to be a judge. I was like, wow. And it was just one direct response. For us, we have so many options because we're privileged. We can be anybody we want to be. But they have this direct response. And so I asked her, why is it important to have a girl educated? And she responded with, because it's my birthright. This 13-year-old girl told me it's her birthright. She said, just because I am a female, doesn't mean I should be less educated than a male. This is my birthright. Wow. She left such a huge impact on me that when I came to Canada, I began the process for her paperwork to sponsor her. And now I can proudly say, I'm not an only child, I have a little sister. Thank you very much.